Welcome to The Wave Strength, presented by Pacific Life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Wave Strength webinar series. I'm your host, Jim Breen, a marketing director with Pacific Life's institutional division. We have a very exciting episode planned for you today. Uh, we're live here in the studio. Um, today's topic, uh, ESG and sustainable investing, is going to be a lively one. But first, let's get to our guests with us today. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for being here. And uh, before we get to the intros, uh, real interesting. I know we've had great partnerships uh, over the last few years. Um, with us uh, in the studio here, we have um, Joe Crum from uh, Pacific Life and Hervé Dutte from BNP Paribas. Uh, uh, I, I know we want to get into the conversation, but but first, let's maybe learn a little bit about uh, both of your backgrounds. Um, so, so Joe, if we can we can start with you. Maybe help our listeners and our and our viewers today understand. And, uh, you know, what, what your role is at Pacific Life? Certainly. I, I lead the Institutional Capital Markets Group at, at Pacific Life with direct responsibility for our spread margin or, or spread lending business that comprises products that are funding agreements, funding agreement back notes, funding agreement back commercial paper, all supported by the institutional investing capability of the, of the life company. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and uh, you've, you've joined us on the show before. I want to uh, encourage our, our listeners and our, our viewers today to, to head over to YouTube after you watch this show and go like and subscribe the content. You can search some of the content that Joe's been in before. Um, and uh, But let's move on here to uh, Hervé. Hervé, thank you for joining us. Uh, I know you, you came out early morning for you. You've been, uh, you flew out, I think, from, from New York, uh, and you're joining us here on the, uh, the other coast uh, today. So th thank you so much for, for being willing to, to come out and have this live conversation with us. Um, perhaps you can share a little bit with our, our, our viewers about your role at, at BNP Paribas. Sure. Good morning, and thank you so much for having me today. So I'm uh, the Chief Sustainability Officer for BNP Paribas in the Americas. It's actually a role I did create um, over eight years ago. So I think it was one of the very first uh, CSO, as we call it, in the banking industry. Um, prior to that, actually, I spent more than 20 years um, in um, fixed income, commodity, um, and foreign exchange derivative um, on the trading side. Uh, as a chief sustainability officer, um, I oversee uh, two main activities. The first one is the what we call the uh, implementation or integration of ESG policies uh, within uh, our business. So ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance Practices. Uh, make sure that we uh, do... Uh, uh, do the right thing with the right clients. Yes. Um, and the second has been primarily over the last uh, eight plus years, the promotion of what we call sustainable finance. So the financing side, um, trying to marry ESG and traditional financing activities. Wonderful, wonderful. And again, uh, you've joined us on the show before. Uh, after today's show, I encourage our, our uh, viewers to go search uh, YouTube uh, for the Wave Strength content. You can uh, listen to the podcast that we did uh, uh, late last year, I think it was. It was very interesting. Uh, and you really give a deep dive about your role and, and what you've done in those last eight years with BNB Paribas. So again, thanks for joining us, uh, both Hervé and Joe. And let's get right into our conversation today, gentlemen. So as we mentioned, ESG and sustainable investing. Um, um, a very important topic, um, and one that has uh, always been in the DNA of, of Pacific Life, as, as we've as we've talked about, and obviously um, with BNP Paribas, um, you know, frankly, two companies with uh, very rich histories. Uh, BNP Paribas, uh, right at 200 years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, over 150 years of, um, of financial strength and stability from a Pacific Life perspective. Um, so uh, let, let let's dive into that and talk and un 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 unpack this a little bit. So, you know, why does ESG matter? Uh, to to Pacific Life, Joe, um, and, and in particular, uh, sustainable finance. Pacific Life, first and foremost, it's it's a mutual life in insurance company owned by owned by our, our policyholders. Um, the, the the raisin d'etre, that was for you, Hervé. <laughs> right, very nice. It, it, you know, serves a, a, an important social purpose. Right, it's it's securing the uh, the lives and and. Of, of millions of people and, and, and their families. 
right? But on, on a deeper level, you mentioned it, it being in our DNA. Something that's always resonated with me is really the extent to which the elements of ESG that Hervé described uh, have, have been woven into our, our culture you know, long before ESG was, was the... Um, uh, was the concept that it that, that it is today support for uh, meaningful support for environmental co- causes the the preservation of uh, and conservation of marine mammals including the humpback whale the heart of the Pacific life uh, uh, you know branding the uh, the health of our our oceans uh, uh, the uh, you know, development of uh, of an inclusive culture and the fostering of that of that culture really leaning in in a meaningful way to the local and social needs of the local communities uh, where we live and live and work. Uh, and from a business perspective, if you look at our investing activities in our, in our general account investing portfolio, uh, over time you, you would see meaningful uh, investments in uh, renewable energy, uh, in, in environmentally friendly uh, real estate projects in, and in and in affordable housing. Uh, I, again, long before it was a, a targeted initiative uh, under an ESG type of banner or umbrella. Excellent. Uh, and maybe we can uh, go back to last year when there was that initial conversation to to, to build out a framework. Um, can you can you maybe give us a little a bit of history there? I mean, I, I mentioned that. That, that I lead the, the Institutional Capital Markets Group. That, that group is about two years old. Right? We, we, we were, were stood up, if you will, in, in the early part of, uh, of 2020. And you know, from the first time we met with in investors, it was June of, of 2020, we, we were talking about ESG. We were talking about how it was important to our company, it was important to our culture, it was important to our, uh, uh, important to our management. So it, it was it was always a part of uh, of our story, even even before uh, we we looked to effectively frame it in such a way that we could we could take that story out to the global investing community. Mm-hmm. And and that that was important. Um, I think let's also to paint the picture. Both of our companies were in the midst of a global pandemic at that time. Right. And, uh, you know, how does one begin such a large initiative in companies that have, frankly, a lot of uh, history and, and um, uh, very large financial institutions? H- how did that come about? How did you make that happen? You know, I, I have have said many times in, in, in some ways, I, I think the um, the remote nature of, of of our entire team at that point in time actually benefited the effort. Right. We, we were able to get. You know, out of the, you know, the, the normal, you know, day to day and and the and, um, and the distractions uh, and of a of a of a of a corporate culture, really able to have a a, a team focused and dedicated on a, a very specific uh, ambition that that we wanted to be able to 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 frame our uh, our story and create this this sustainable framework and and be in a position to tell that story then to the marketplace in the form of a of a sustainable or green debt offering, and and we had a very specific and limited time frame in which in which to do that. And again, working remotely, again working away from a lot of the, the committee structures and other you know typical type of corporate bureaucracy, I think allowed us to to execute and be very nimble and agile in 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 fulfilling that ambition. Yeah, and and I think to being part of the, the group that that assisted on that, it was you, we had a unique opportunity in during that pandemic to focus on. Um, communication tools in terms of the external marketing that, um, you know, using a real video centric approach, um, kind of creative, creative marketing, utilizing this, this platform also to kind of get the message out there. And I think that was, that was also uh, uh, one of those unique innovations that, that this team was able to <laughs> really move quickly on. It, 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 well, and, and you talk about the team effort. I mean, no one will ever, I, I, I joke about being a very right brain thinker. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a math guy, I'm a numbers guy you know, throughout my in, entire career. And, and the ability to, to leverage the real strengths that were available within in the team on, on the on the marketing and the storytelling and the packaging side, really to get the, the most impact, uh, I, I think, for the, uh, the the content, really the real substance in, in the story that we were trying to tell, uh, differentiated uh, the the introduction of, of this of this program to the to the broader market. 
and a very important story to tell. Um, speaking of story, uh, Hervé, perhaps we can dive into, you know, VNP Paribas story now. So uh, can you share with our, our viewers, you know, how your organization uh, has that, that commitment to, you know, sustainable financing in particular? Sure. Um, so first, banks uh, are very um, intimately connected to societal impact. In fact, uh, Finance is, uh, I would say, the blood of our societal fabri fabric. We help people uh, buy their first home, their first car, uh, possibly launch their first uh, or second company and, and keep all of that going um, forward. Um, now, truly, ESG has really come to the fore over the last uh, 20 plus years, I would say. Um, and first, it came through the lenses of risk management. Um, the, uh, over the last two decades, uh, it became really apparent that we had to exercise greater scrutiny on uh, the environmental, the social practices uh, of our clients because that uh, was also becoming part of the risk that, that we would take. So in the asset management side, um, it led to practices that we call SRI, socially responsible investment, or ESG integration, where at the minimum you screen your clients, exclude really the, the, the those who have very bad practices, um, and progressively move to uh, uh, try to emphasize those that have that are best in class in the, in their sectors. On the financing side, um, over the last. 10, 12 years, we've developed a series of policies on, on most sensitive sectors, uh, whether it's um, the agriculture sector, uh, the mining sector, the defense sector, et cetera, to, to um, um, be really selective about the clients we, we choose to, to accompany. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, and that's where your, your, connection, your question comes, um, there's been also a focus on sustainable finance. It's still part of risk management, I would say, but we realize that risks are not solely tied to um, the individual clients that we have, but also to the broader environment in which we all operate. And we need to manage this, these systemic risks that are not owned by any single client, uh, which we collectively own. And so the idea of sustainable finance is really to promote through pot potentially financial incentives, um, better ESG practices, which will collectively secure the environment and protect our collective portfolios. So uh, we've really spent, um, and I think BNP Paribas has been a pioneer, first of all, and certainly now a leader, Absolutely. in trying to uh, really push the ball as far as we could and integrate ESG into all asset classes. Um, and, th and the whole idea was that when you were uh, financing um, either projects that had a, a sustainable impact or financing large corporations that overall had good ESG practices, we could uh, better finance them when that was the case. And then it becomes a catch-22 type of, of, of situation where because you can have better financing through better ESG practices, overall, hopefully, we make the world a touch better. Making the world a better place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, which kind of ties into our next question. Uh, you know, for Pacific Life, Joe, um, was the framework, was the issuance in uh, last year in 2021, which at the time, largest uh, uh, issuance uh, in, in U.S. financial history, in the insurance industry, in the, yes. in the insurance industry, excuse me. But what was this a one-off? Was this a one-off scenario? And and if not, let's let's unpack that. Why not? No, and, and that that was a a key line of questioning when we engaged with in, investors. Just being able to put it out in front of them that when we we took our our first deal to market, uh, April uh, uh, of last year, we were we were committing to to industry leading kind of. ESG principles uh, on a on a go forward basis for for years to come at, at at that point, and we were building a platform from which we could tell our stories to that global investor community as well as to our our, our customers and our em employees, um, and, and you will see embedded within our with within our framework. I mean, there were 
there were both the elements that, that exist today that I, that I talked about, but there were also aspirational elements, um, to, uh, terrestrial and, and aquatic biodiversity, right? Um, yeah, you know, tying together uh, the, the commitments that Pacific Life has. Uh, uh, again, I mentioned the, uh, the Marine Conservancy and the health of, health of our oceans with our in investment activities. That, that, that is an aspirational uh, target for the company. But as a result of the, the framework and, and the momentum that we have, it's something that we're actively talking about and engaging in and, and making progress towards. Ab absolutely. And, and then also, too, um, as you mentioned, it's in the DNA of the company. You know, this is something that was not just, oh, let's try this. It's, 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 it's something that has been on in the hearts and the minds of, of our company for, for quite some time. Well, I, I talked about, I talk about it frequently, right? I, I think the, um, uh, the bond framework at the time that we were putting it in place uh, served as something of a, a North Star, really kind of providing some very specific short-term uh, direction and objectives for any number of, of um, initiatives that were going on around the company, you know, providing that context and, 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 and again, the structure in which we were going to, to, to focus and, and, tell that, uh, and, and, and tell that story. Um, and I think that the framework itself has served now as, a, as a, something of a stepping stone to, to a, a broader and more comprehensive uh, ESG framework at the at the enterprise level for mm -hmm. the, for the company. Yeah, d truly demonstrating that commitment to the future. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you know, Hervé uh, with BNP Paribas, obviously, as you mentioned, you know, uh, in your role uh, now these I think eight years you mentioned uh, in your role, uh, this is nothing new to you. But but perhaps you know you can paint the picture. You know, maybe even reverse the clock eight years ago when you were at um, a similar uh, level in terms of that engagement. W what 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 where were you then and where are you now maybe you can co compare con contrast into these um you know um great things that that you have done well eight years ago first of all climate change was totally uh an unknown element in the finance sector i think why well, now um i mean across all financial institutions we've uh, we've got to to terms with the fact that it, it's real and it, that it, it is a risk. So that's one thing. The other is we were not talking about ESG, and, I've re, uh, and, and now it's everywhere. Um, and I believe finance, um, mainstream finance, is um, the main reason we hear, we hear it across all corporates, all TV channels, all media. I think finance has been the uh, the element that has finally brought it to a universal audience. Uh, of course, you had NGOs. Of course, you had the UN. Of course, you had some niche players, um, impact funds or whatever. But over the last 15 or even 50 years until around 2015, this remained niche. And so what has happened? In the, in the last five, seven years. And I think what has happened is that we've man managed to make a connection, first of all, between uh, financial returns, whether or simply cost of funding, and your ESG uh, performance. So I think we owe that to the entire financial industry, from banks to um, asset managers, asset owners, uh, and, and, and investors. Um, we have tried to, as I said earlier, to put ESG in everything that we propose. So BNP globally is split into three main uh, businesses. One is retail banking, a second one is investment banking, catering to large corporates, and the third one is what we call investment and protection services, which runs from um, wealth management, insurance, um, uh, real estate uh, and, and some other uh, activities. In um, we have a car leasing company called Arval that leases over a million vehicles. Uh, we have uh, we are growing uh, offers with a real focus on hybrid and electric vehicles. Um, and on the investment banking side. Um, we've really tried to bring uh, a series of first transactions. For example, in 2016, we did the first sustainable supply chain financing solutions, where for a uh, sportswear manufacturer, 
you know, banks finance the working capital of those uh, corporations with their supply chain. And there, the financing that we were providing to those suppliers um, was the, the interest rate that was paid by the supplier would move up or down in relation to those suppliers' um, environmental and social performance. So really linking clear metrics to interest rates. It's a first, almost the first in the history of lending over 2,000 years that the interest rate is not solely uh, linked to uh, your ability to repay, but also to your ability to do good. So this is an example of how we've really tried to use our brain to uh, integrate ESG into financial products. Excellent. That's great. And, you know, that, that ties in nicely to our, our next segment here where we do talk about the future and, and that, that integration. What is next? And, you know, Joe, we'll start with you. Um, you know, how is the, the ESG ambition and, and commitment to our sustainable bond framework? How, how is that reflective, not just in our core DNA, but, you know, as we move ahead? Um, and perhaps we can talk a little bit about um, our, um, our sustainalytics report, recent st sustainalytics report. Sure. We can talk about it in a number uh, of ways. And, you know, I mentioned on the business side our, our core investing activities, and, and Nervé was, was, was speaking to that, that point as well, and, and, and the sizable investments we had in a number of different uh, asset classes that are consistent with our, with our framework. But what the framework really allowed to do, and this use of proceeds concept that's associated with our going out and talking to investors and ra raising money specific for the framework, is it really allows us to increase our focus in those areas, increase the, the energy, so we're no longer just looking, we're no longer evaluating in investments as they come in on an ESG uh, or environmental type basis, but we're actively, we're actively going out and trying to source assets in that, in, in, that meet those, those characteristics, making that impact that, that Hervé had talked about, and we can talk about how we measure that as, uh, a, a, as well. Um, and when we went out and, and we spoke to, uh, 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 again, I referenced the investors when we, we initially went out, we heard a lot of good things, a lot of positive feedback coming back about our, our framework. Okay? It's, it's credible, it's, it's impactful, um, it, it's meaningful, uh, but we also had, you know, we're, we're pressed and, and, and we, we saw some pressure from investors, which we appreciate, that feedback that we were looking for in, in terms of, of where, how to chart our future course. Uh, there were questions about do we have specific measurable targets as, a, as an institution in, in the contributions uh, that, we're, that we're, we're looking to make. Uh, we, we were asked if, if we would uh, consider going out and, and, and getting a third party type um, evaluation or, or rating uh, for many of the um, elements that we were discussing and averring to, to, the, to the investor uh, community. And, and we took that feedback very seriously, and, and, and they have been priorities for us in, in the interim. And um, you know, a couple reports you may have been uh, re referring to. Um, one is the, is, is the annual report associated with our, with our, our program, the, um, uh, the bond, the $800 million bond that we, we, we put out last year. We told investors how we were going to use those funds, and we promised to come back to them on a periodic basis uh, uh, to, to report on our, our progress. We just published... Um, uh, and it was, it was the, the audit, if you will, was performed by Sustainalytics. Uh, their report is now available on our, on our investor relations uh, website. But, but effectively, the bottom line is that we, we, we told investors where we were going to go out and, and invest, and, and we followed through and, and deployed the full $800 million in during this first year of, um, uh, of the program's existence. Um, I... I, I, I I measured the, the hope or the intent to have a measurable impact. As, as the report details, the investments we can directly correlate uh, to is, is 4.8 gigawatts of, 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 of renewable energy uh, capacity. It was you know, more than 2 million or almost 2 million square feet of you know, Leeds Gold certified um, from an energy efficiency perspective uh, real estate. It was providing affordable housing for uh, 44,000 um, you know, people as a part of the efforts under this, this framework, making a difference, doing good in our, in, in our community. And, 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 I, and again, for us, it's a starting point. It wasn't, that, it wasn't intended to be one time. Uh, we look forward to, to building on, on the momentum coming from that, 
from that report. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, you mentioned the the, the ratings also, the, these recent ratings uh, that, that uh, were, were announced from uh, Sustainalytics as well. Yeah. I, I mentioned we're a mutual company, right? One of the difficulties for a mutual company when it comes to uh, others looking in from the outside is we don't have the same level of public disclosure generally as our as our public peers. So difficult for a, a, a third party rating agency, whether it's MSCI or Sustainalytics or, or someone to uh, to opine on on our our ESG bona fides, right? If if if, if you will, uh, and and listening to that investor feedback, we 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 reached out effectively and and engaged Sustainalytics, um, offering to provide some of that insight that they were otherwise not able to to directly access in order to develop. Um, a, a rating that is meaningful to the to that global investor community. That that exercise was just concluded. You can you can find the results from that either on the Sustainalytics website or is tied on our investor relations website uh, as well. Uh, you know, pleased with our baseline score, but as importantly for us, and again, you asked if this is a one-time thing or something we're going to do going forward. It provides something of a roadmap to say, hey, these these are the elements in the areas where where we need to uh, either tighten our story or improve our game. Right or where there's there's opportunities to to further enhance uh, those aspects of uh, of the program that we're that we're so committed to. Absolutely, especially as we continue to tell that story uh, of strength, stability, and, and commitment uh, to this market moving forward. Right. And and a number of those elements, honestly, I think just reflects the relative immaturity uh, of our program. Uh, if if you look at certain of the aspects that were highlighted, it's not that they weren't embedded in our processes. Right, uh, but that the elements weren't enshrined right in specific policies, right, which, which th these third-party evaluators you know look for in terms of you know, confirming that it's you know truly a part of the uh, of the business and the business culture. Uh, excellent. Um, now, Ray, I, I definitely want to get your uh, response to this from a, a BNP Paribas uh, standpoint, but I want to encourage our viewers. Uh, we do have a chat function in the LinkedIn Live event that you're currently attending. Feel free to add your questions, comments in there, uh, and we'll do our best to get to them here shortly uh, as we uh, begin to wrap up in a little bit, and we'll uh, do our best to get to those, those questions that you're, you're asking uh, in the chat. So uh, again, thanks for continuing to join us, and uh, let's dive right back into it here. So you know, moving forward from a, a BNP Paribas standpoint, Hervé, um, perhaps you can talk about um, you know, that, that commitment uh, with your organization, perhaps, uh, for example, you know, short-term targets and, and commercial strategy from that perspective. Sure. For us, what's uh, very, very important at this stage is really to finance the energy transition um, and in a way that accelerates it. Um, and it means two things. Uh, one is to um, align our portfolios uh, with uh, the, the, the goals of the Paris Agreement. And the other is uh, really to have a commercial strategy um, that will accelerate both um, the transformation of our clients, but also the transformation of our own portfolios. We joined the uh, Net Zero Banking Alliance uh, last year. We were actually a founding uh, signatory of it um, over a year ago now. And with that, we did commit to uh, align our lending portfolios to, to Net Zero by 2050. Um, we just recently published uh, our uh, targets for the for, th for three uh, carbon intensive sectors. Uh, and just to give you a sense of what it means to align your portfolio. So, for example, in the power sector, uh, we've committed to by 2025, uh, st starting from a uh, 2020 baselines, uh, we've committed to uh, in the if you look at the energy mix that we finance, uh, that uh, over 66% uh, of the energy mix that we finance comes from renewable energy and then less than 5% uh, comes from coal. We've in fact uh, a few years ago committed to be totally out of coal by 2030 in any OECD or European country and by 2040 uh, in the rest of the world. Um, in the oil and gas sector, for example, also we committed to reduce um, our um, lending uh, balance sheet to um, upstream uh, oil and gas by 12% um, by 2025. And actually, uh, the lending to uh, upstream oil, so production and exploration, by 25% by uh, 2025. And the in the auto sector, just to give a, a last example, 
uh, we aim at financing more than 20, if you look at the powertrain mix, this time that we finance, uh, we have a goal to have at least 25% of that by 20, 2025 being electrified. So these are very clear uh, targets, um, which gives us like a north star of where we want to go. Um, it's sufficiently ahead in time um, that we can have an active dialogue with our clients. They know the, the direction and that we're taking and we are uh, not alone going that way. Uh, now, from a commercial perspective, um, last year we did create uh, the Low Carbon Transition Group, uh, which will be a 250 people strong uh, division, obviously working with our all other divisions from bankers and product uh, partners, but really uh, having a focus on, uh, especially on those most carbon intensive uh, sectors to really bring uh, knowledge, expertise, um, and dedicated financing, uh, especially of those new technologies uh, that can accelerate uh, this transition. So it means deepening for us uh, the commercial dialogue with what I would call transition-ready clients uh, to have a clear dialogue with those who are uh, slow movers, I would say. Uh, and finally, and I will uh, finish with that, also em um, embrace new clients uh, who are uh, emerging uh, in, that, in, in that space of the green economy uh, in fact, we have uh, committed more than 200 million euros of VC capital uh, towards what I would say clean techs uh, and another 200 uh, million towards natural capital and, um, and social impact, which again, we're um, talking about the investment banking arm of the bank here. So we're not an investor and yet we have more than 400 million euros of uh, VC capital um, dedicated to support uh, those uh, emerging uh, business models that will be key partners of our very large clients. Boy, so much going on, so much going on. And obviously uh, so many, I, I'm sure the team you have also to just a, a very committed team um, as well. And I know Pacific Life uh, the same way. Uh, it, it's reassuring to know that there is that support in, in, in our organizations, right? When we, when we have these grand ideas uh, that we, we have, have that support. I mean, have you felt that way at, at BNP Paribas? Yeah, I mean, no, abs absolutely. And what has been wonderful at BNP Paribas is that it really started as a bottom-up story. Mm -hmm. um, so more than eight years ago, I would say, where uh, has have risen uh, a number of um, dedicated experts and staff in a variety of business divisions, uh, really trying to uh, marry high-tech finance and purpose and impact. Um, and then shortly after it got embraced by the top as well. But uh, it's been a, a really, there's been a very strong momentum. And I, I think that has, what has been very defining for BNP Paribas, that it really started as a bottom-up uh, story that uh, that spread uh, in a viral fas fashion uh, and, and, and got structured then by top management. Well, excellent. Great conversation so far. Um, but uh, let's uh, take a little break from the, 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 the questions that we have and go to see uh, what our uh, uh, viewers want to say here. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring up some questions. Um, and we'll start, uh, Joe. Um, Joe, you've been in the industry for for. 25 plus years. Um, and what has surprised you the most? Well, thank you, Jim, for, for that. You, you know, on, all about honesty, <laughs> Joe. All about honesty. Um, you don't, don't, it looks like it might be 10 years. I mean, you, you don't, don't, you're looking great. Uh, but, you know, what surprised you most in this sector, in, you know, in these last 25 years or even, frankly, in the last 12 months? I think one of the things that I didn't expect or perhaps underestimated was the level of interest in what we were doing, this, this whole bond framework uh, initiative. Uh, both internal at Pacific Life, the, the interest, as, as well as, uh, as external. Uh, I, I, I talk about it, uh, uh, the, the initiative, a bit like a, a vortex, or perhaps a, a snowball is, is a better analogy, that, that 
people start talking about it and hearing about it and they want to hear more and they want to be involved and they want to understand how they can contribute. I mean, it's a, it's a conversation and that, again, I mentioned internal and external. Even with my, my kids who have no interest generally in what I do for a, for a living or what I do at work, wanted to engage on, on, on this topic and understand how I was finally making a, 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 a positive contribution to something that was important to, uh, 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 to them. Um, uh, yeah, but but seriously, the I think the energy and you you had asked about was this a one time thing. I think the energy in the organization uh, is is actually greater now a year in than it was at the at the, at the time that we launched, and we were very enthused at at that point. Mm-hmm. And and um, just a, a follow, uh, you know, kind of a follow up for for Hervé, um, you know, you talked a little bit about you know what's next. You talked a little bit about. Um, you know, some of the uh, in- initiatives planned uh, on deck for BMP Paribas. But, you know, w- where do you see this? You know, you, with the experience you have, these eight years in, in the role that you're, you know, in the next five years, you know, what do you hope to see? Uh, maybe with, whether it's globally, whether it's uh, domestically here in the U.S., what, 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 do, you, what do you hope for? Hmm. Um, yeah, the last five plus years were really about advocacy. I, th- uh, I would say it was about bringing to the surface um, this topic of ESG and making sure it made, it made its way within business. I think the next five years, um, I'd say for me the focus would be on um, stewardship. Uh, so moving from an advocate to a steward, uh, meaning now that everyone is on it, uh, we need to make sure that we develop and maintain very high ambitions, very high standards. It's one thing to um, uh, tie back to the ESG label, but it really has to to keep meaning something. And, and that something has to be uh, harder and harder as the years progress. So, uh, so um, to your question, uh, my hope is that we continue to raise the standards. Uh, it's great that everyone has uh, boarded on the ship. Uh, now we need to sail uh, far and fast. Uh, so that's one thing. The other, I would hope, um, faster, clearer, and yet uh, globally harmonized uh, support from the public sector, because we, uh, you and I can do, uh, or by that, I mean our organizations can do it, can do it alone. Uh, we really need to have a level uh, playing field uh, across nations, um, and and so so that's um, that, that's actually my, my my hope. And the last one, if I may say, um, please, the uh, we try to bring the spotlight first on ESG uh, in the last um, the last decade. Uh, now we are actively, and that's what. I was kind of uh, hinting at earlier, but we're kind of actively trying to bring the spotlight on this notion of transition, and especially on this notion of transition risk. Um, it's our conviction that the the world is under a, a, a deep transformation, um, the kind of the one we saw 20 years ago with the, uh, the tech and digital uh, boom and how it has transformed our lives, how some corporations have disappeared, how, how some new ones uh, have appeared. And the same will be true uh, in this green revolution. We have the, the benefit of hindsight in a way. We've lived through it once uh, in the early 2000s. Um, so we know the world can change fast. Mm-hmm. Um, we have 28 years left to uh, fix the problem, uh, but things will accelerate, Di- disruptions will appear, but we have, it's still time to manage them, and everyone, I, I, I believe, uh, has a chance uh, to, to, to go on the, uh, on the right journey, but the decisions have to be made now. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Uh, the next question, Joe, for you. Um, let's rewind the clock back a year, uh, in, in roughly April 2021. Um, how did investors respond to the, the sustainable bond framework? In a word, I would call it tremendous. It was a tremendous response. Um, uh, we, we engaged with more than, than 70 global I- I investors in, in the run-up to, uh, 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 to, to the initial uh, issuance. I, I I mentioned some of the um, uh, 
uh, the, the positive attributions that investors gave us regarding uh, the framework. I think that was reflected in 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 the order book. Uh, the number of you know, the interest in investing in our bond uh, at over two billion dollars of, of of global orders, right? And and we ended up printing a bond for eight hundred million that had you know seventy one investors. And as we categorized them, I, I believe 56 or 58 percent of those investors were were, were uh, properly categorized as global ESG investors. That 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 um, that growing cadre that that Hervé had mentioned, and and 26 investors were, were new to Pacific Life and new to our, our program. They had not previously engaged with our company or or much less in, uh, invested invested dollars in in our company and what we were trying to accomplish. Next question for Hervé. Uh, Lily Bowes asks, uh, you know, can you share a little more about the Net Zero Banking Alliance? And this is a great question. I actually heard, was going to do a follow-up with that. So I'm glad, Lily, you asked that. Thank you. And maybe um, some specific institutional commitment shifts um, that are required to meet uh, the 2050 target? Sure. So the um, let's rewind a little bit. First, you had... Um, I would say it started about three years ago, um, the first wave of net zero commitments taken by traditional corporations, so basically in the industrial world. And then over the last two years, uh, the same uh, wave of commitments started to appear among what we call the financial institutions. And in fact, um, so there's one first acronym called GFANS, which is the Global Financial Alliance for Net Zero that was started by Mark Carney, um, which um, encompasses uh, so far four uh, initiatives, uh, the uh, Net Zero um, Asset Owner Alliance, the Net Zero Asset Manager Initiative, then came a year ago, the Net Zero Banking Alliance, and then it was followed shortly after by the insurers. Um, so altogether, it's uh, over 200 um, uh, institutions, large financial institutions committed uh, to literally align their portfolios, their lending portfolios, or their investment portfolios with the goals of the Paris Agreement, uh, and more specifically to uh, of a 1.5 degree uh, target, uh, which means basically to be net zero by 2050. So um, I think it's we should not um, underestimate this initiative because uh, no matter how large a traditional corporation can be in there are a lot of brand names that can come to mind and how uh, no matter how laudable uh, and impressive uh, a net zero commitment can be for those uh, we are a thousand times those i mean we are invested in uh, thousands of companies or lending to thousands of companies and so we have a huge leverage when any of our institution commits to net zero, um, we are forcing all our in investees uh, or borrowers uh, to transform because we can't we can't do it ourselves. Uh, we'll be net zero if our clients are net zero. So um, this is the the, the spirit uh, of the Net Zero Banking Alliance, uh, basically, so on the lending side, and to do that. Um, we have taken, we, when we joined the NCBA, we are making a commitment to have specific intermediary targets uh, within the first 18 months on the most carbon intensive sectors and then within three years uh, on the rest. So I gave you three examples earlier. Um, you can Im imagine that if we say we're reducing our oil and gas lending portfolio, um, the upstream part by 12% um, within the next four years, uh, it's uh, I it's a real uh, it's a real commitment. Excellent, and um, I think we have time for just one more. Um, Hervé, we'll, we'll throw this one to you uh, from Aaron. Aaron, thanks so much for joining the, the conversation here. Um, Aaron asks for BNP Paribas. You know, uh, Hervé, perhaps you can uh, answer this one. Be so, beyond being a basic source of alpha generation, what are some of the other risk associated qualities of ESG that you see? Numerous. I mean, the. Um, uh, First, it's risk management, as I said. Um, you don't want uh, to, to, to be lending to uh, or investing in a company which may get stranded assets, for example. Uh, 
Um, so for that, you need long-term vision. And ESG forces you to have this long-term vision. It's not about short-term um, um, uh, returns or uh, avoiding short-term risk. Um, but it's really about managing the, the medium to long-term future. So um, that's, that's one benefit. Um, currently, it generates alpha, I think, because you have much greater demand than, than supply. Um, but overall, you should not be necessarily significantly uh, different than, than, than the broader market. However, in the longer term, that may be different. In fact, uh, you have a, a lot of studies that, that shows that in the longer run, you um, have uh, no less uh, and maybe slightly more return uh, than traditional investing with uh, no more or slightly less uh, volatility. So uh, basically, you, you improve your better. Um, but uh, overall, it's, uh, it's about um, the, the, the long term. And finally, it also, from an investor perspective or a lender perspective, it gives you an op opportunity to have a, a much deeper dialogue uh, with uh, the companies uh, you transact with. Uh, and through this broadened dialogue than just uh, the next quarterly earnings, you get a lot of insights um, through... I wouldn't want to say peripheral issues, but you get a lot of insights of how the management is really thinking, is really operating, is making business decisions, even in the most immediate short-term uh, financially uh, impactful uh, issues. Well, great. Uh, Hervé, thank you for that. And uh, those of you who joined our, our chat Q&A, appreciate you uh, asking these questions. It's always nice to have conversations with uh, the folks that are joining us in these events. And as we close here, you know, I want to take an opportunity to really thank the two of you, Joe, Hervé, for coming on the show today, to being part of the conversation and helping perhaps educate folks uh, what our organizations have, um, uh, you know, in terms of that commitment to the future. Oh, uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you for having us. A absolutely, Joe. Uh, and uh, we look forward to more opportunities, Hervé, to, to have you on, on the show moving forward. And we're grateful for that partnership as well. Uh, also to our viewers, we want to thank you for spending your morning with us or your day or wherever you are in the world. Uh, and I also want to encourage you to head over to YouTube, Spotify, or Audible, search the Wave Strength, like and subscribe the content, and feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions about new content you'd like to see. And to that point, how can folks reach out to you if they have any questions? On LinkedIn, I think uh, they, they can reach me directly on, on LinkedIn. They can also reach us through the, the Pacific Life uh, Investor Relations website where you can find contacts to, to reach my team or me directly. Uh, and we'd be happy to, to take follow-up questions, perhaps questions we didn't get to during the, uh, during the session today. Uh, and it's a, it's a conversation that we welcome uh, the opportunity to, to engage um, because that feedback only makes us better in, in terms of what we're trying to uh, trying to accomplish. Absolutely. And, and how could folks reach out to you? Same. Uh, I can be reached on LinkedIn, and I will, uh, would invite uh, your viewers to uh, visit our website as well, the sustainability section. Uh, it has hundreds of stories like yours, but that I think put flesh around what sustainable finance is about. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, Hervé, again, Joe, and to our audience. We'll see you next time. This has been another episode of The Wave Strength, presented by Pacific Life. Don't forget to catch us on YouTube and make sure to subscribe. Although this is presented by Pacific Life, the opinions and views expressed are those of the hosts and participants and do not necessarily reflect Pacific Life's views on any of the topics discussed. Pacific Life is a product provider. It is not a fiduciary and therefore does not give advice or make recommendations regarding insurance or investment products. Pacific Life, its affiliates, its distributors, and respective representatives do not provide any employer-sponsored qualified plan administrative services or impartial advice about investments and do not act in a fiduciary capacity for any plan. Pacific Life refers to Pacific Life Insurance Company, Newport Beach, California, and its affiliates, including Pacific Life and Annuity Company. Insurance products are issued by Pacific Life Insurance Company in all states except New York and in all states by Pacific Life and Annuity Company. Product availability and features may vary by state. Each insurance company is solely responsible for the financial obligations accruing under the products it issues. This was recorded on May 4th, 2022.